We should be live now. Hopefully, hopefully I tried to get us um, right about at seven o'clock. And um, that's what it looks like on my end. So <laughs> very good. Hopefully I tried to get us some. I'm going to bring in about at seven o'clock. I need to um, turn this one down. Okay. And let me know if you are here in the chat, if you can hear me. And I am going to introduce my guest here in just a second. I'm going to bring her up. And I have got Carrie Cunningham with me. So everybody say hi. Say hi to Carrie. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? I hope I have um, hope I have uh, <laughs> hope I have live going here. <laughs> I think we do. I think we do. There's always that delay, and that's always a little a little bit tricky. So I saw the notification. Uh, I think we're live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very good. All right. So I want to say hello to everybody. This is the Let's Go So live show with Joanne Banco, your host here, and my wonderful guest, Carrie Cunningham. And Let's Go Sew Live shows are where sewing enthusiasts gather to be inspired and learn more about their machines. So it's all about, it's all about learning how to use your machine and learning how to sew and having um, happy times in your own personal sewing space. That's what this show is all about. So yes, Carrie, how are you doing? Have you had a good day today? I have had a good day, a busy day, but a good day. It's 80 degrees here, so it's, it's nice out. I got some time outside. Oh, wow. You had yeah. a great, you had a uh, summer, in, Indian yeah. summer, we call that, right? Yes, yes. Indian summer. <laughs> but I'm enjoying it. Oh, I'm not ready to let go of summer yet myself. So oh, me either. We'll, keep, we'll keep, it, keep it going as long as we possibly can. So, yes, Carrie is... Um, uh, been a friend of mine for uh, quite some time. Uh, I think we met down at one of the Southern big shows a In while Baton back. Rouge. <laughs> Baton Rouge. Yep. yep. That was a big group. There were a lot of us that kind of connected there and, and made friends and, um, and stayed friends ever since then. But Carrie is, um, you're going to find out a lot about Carrie tonight and you're going to find out a <laughs> lot of different tips and tricks because Carrie is what I would call a uh, sewing educator extraordinaire. And I mean that in, in, in the true sense of the word, because Carrie not only knows how to sew, Carrie teaches how to sew, and Carrie sews really, really, really beautifully. And oh. Carrie's um, <laughs> style is very inspiring, very inspiring. So um, Carrie is the owner and operator of a, her own blog called Endless Designs by Carrie. Carrie, would you like to spell that for me real quick? <laughs> so that's, that's actually my website name and group name. The blog okay. is so Carrie so, but Endless Designs is spelled E-N-D-L-E-S-S-D-Z-N-S-B-Y, Carrie, C-A-R-R-I-E. Hey, it's just the designs part that's a little, yes, little, little trickier and, to. And little that was a that was the Etsy thing. So I first started with Etsy, and I could only use so many characters. <laughs> ah. So that's how I, that's how it went to that spelling because I couldn't get the other word in there. <laughs> so I just kept it. I see, I see. A lot of people so, don't know that. <laughs> so you have a website, and then you also have another site that you blog on, or do you blog on your actual website? I, I have a separate blog and the blog okay. is so Carrie. So S C W Carrie S C W. Okay. And then you're also active on Instagram and yes. you have your own Facebook group, correct? I do. Okay. Well, and I want to everybody... <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. And a business page. Okay. Very good. So I want everybody to know that uh, when the show's over, I'll be putting all of that information into the show notes so that you don't miss anything. Cause we don't want to have to spell out each one of those right now, do we? <laughs> <laughs> well, everything is under endless designs by Carrie, except the block. Okay, great. Great. And so tell me a little bit of how you came up with that name. Did it just pop into your head or, or did you do some, 
some searching or how'd that happen? I did some searching and I wanted the name to have the word Genesis in it, but everywhere I searched, that name was highly in use, regardless of how I positioned it or added things to it. It was just in use. So I finally ended up with, uh, I learned to use my name uh, from someone else, always put your name in. So I ended up with Endless versus Genesis. (laughs) It has a good ring to it though, for sure. I like it. <laughs> uh, I want to take just a second to welcome some people here. We've got Society, uh, Linda, I see Clovis here, uh, Josie Sows, Sheila, Paula, Joey Jackson, um, Marilyn, Brenda. We got lots of people here with us already tonight. So that's nice. great. It always takes just a few minutes for everybody to kind of roll in. Oh, I lost your volume. Oh, did did you lose me? Okay. (laughs) I am using a new microphone tonight. So uh, it's got, it's got more, it's got more bells and whistles on it than I'm used to. (laughs) So (laughs) I might, I might punch the wrong button from time to time. All right. Well, Carrie, um, I understand that you've been sewing since you were 11 years old. That's what, that's what I have here in my notes yeah. And that you were um, self-taught until you went to high school. So does that mean you didn't have sewing class until high school? So we were supposed to start sewing in sixth grade. And you had this really long document, pages and pages of stuff you had to fill out. And it really taught you how to take your machines apart, put them back together. But you had to complete that before you could actually use the machine. Well, I didn't complete it until the last day of school. My handwriting was extremely slow. And so I presented it on the last day of school. I never got to use the machine. I came home in tears and I was a neighborhood babysitter. So I'm coming down the block and I'm crying, I'm sobbing and everybody's going, what's wrong with her? (laughs) And my mom comes out, she goes, what is wrong? And I said, they wouldn't let me use the sewing machine. Oh, so no. I ended up I ended up around the corner at my great aunt's house, who I had never noticed the machine sitting in the, I don't know if it was a living room or a dining room, but it was sitting in the middle of this room and I had never noticed it there. And I'm sure it had been there just because I wasn't interested. I hadn't noticed. Um, and she was blind or partially blind and she couldn't have really help me. So I, I really took that information from that packet of information and started to use that machine and just kind of self-taught. My mom had watched, my mom didn't sew, but she had watched her mother sew. And my grandmother passed when I was an infant, so I didn't even get that. Uh, But my mom was able to help me to know where the sleeve went, where the collar went and those kind of things and how to kind of of square up the buttonholes. And so I made a lot of stuff that people would be afraid of as beginners now. I didn't know to be afraid of them. I made a shirt with collar, buttonholes, sleeves. I made a apron with ties and gathers and a pocket. I made a skirt with a zipper and a waistband. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> so I got all the basics and all those pieces. So by the time I got to high school, um, my teacher was thrilled. She had one girl in the class that who, who could actually sew. <laughs> that's, that's really something. That probably doesn't happen very often. But I'd love no, to hear sure. in the chat. If um, anybody else had any kind of experience like that, where you already knew how to, you know, if you had sewing classes in school, um, did you already know how to sew before you went to school? That would be really (laughs) interesting to find out. So make sure you um, um, talk to each other in the chat too. And if you have questions, we're going to try to save those uh, for the end because it's easier for me to see them at the end, but make sure you um, chat amongst yourselves too. I'd love to see that, um, those comments in there, whether, whether anybody knew how to sew before. They went to school. I sure didn't. So that's, that's a great, that's a great advantage to have for sure. Yes, it was, but, and because of that, she sent me to a tailoring class once a, once a week, which I hated, but I remember everything I learned there. I just hated going down there because I was the only girl. I was youngest kid and I was the only girl in the class. <clears throat> and, um, but she sent me to drapery manufacturers and lingerie manufacturers and costume manufacturers and to all these places. So I learned a lot because I already had the knowledge and she just kept sending me out, sending me out, sending me out. <laughs> and that was all from your high school teacher. Yes. Yes. Wow. Miss Farley. She must have seen something in you that she knew was going to be your future. 
Wow. Well, we got the only thing more... we thought about was zippers because I have self-taught zippers and I never pinned them in. And I still don't today. I never pinned them in or basted them in. And she would, if she watched me put the zipper in, she would make me take it back out, either basted it and pin it. And I say, oh, it's going to be crooked. And then sure enough, it'd be crooked. And I would never get an A on those projects. She gave me an A minus. <laughs> Oh my. Yeah, I learned a lot from her. Great teacher. I want to say hi to just a few more people that have popped in. Um, Patty's here. Let's see who else is here. Um, Marie's here. Daisy May is here. Debbie's here. And Jane and Barbara. Um, Marie. Patty. Everybody's talking about um, what they when they sewed and if they sewed in school and how that all went. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So did you, did um, your sewing when you were doing that then, did that spark any interest in any of your friends or your family members? Did anybody see you doing it and say, Hey, I want to do that too. You know, there's a lady that I just recently reconnected with. She, she reminded me that I taught her to sew when we were in our first year of high school. I don't remember teaching her. I still don't remember teaching her, but she went on to make, uh, she makes wedding gowns. And she said, "Those that's the only class she ever had was for me. <laughs> wow. So you don't know the influence that, that you've had, you know? Right. Did you make um, clothes that you wore to school? I did. Once I started sewing, I sewed like crazy. Uh, and people would ask me, if you didn't make your own clothes, the neighbors would ask me, if you didn't make your own clothes, would you have this many clothes? And I said, no, because my parents can't afford it. So I know that my mother was giving me, she would give me a, a fabric allowance. And so I had this fabric allowance and it, and it had, and she would say it has to work for this many pieces. And so I just would make it work. Wow. So you yeah. learned, you learned the economy of sewing at the same time that you were learning the craft too. Yeah. In my last year of high school, she gave me enough money to buy fabric to make one garment for every day of the week of that last week of school, oh, which was wow. pretty awesome. Before it was like for the month, but this was for that week. So I had a brand new outfit every day last week of school. <laughs> and do you remember your first sewing machine? <clears throat> I do. It was a singer. She bought it. My mom bought it for me. Uh, a little green metal machine, super, super heavy. Um, and I kept it probably until I was in my mid twenties. I, I kept it for many, many years, but I sewed on it until I was in my mid twenties. And she actually bought me another one. <laughs> it's hard to part with that, that first machine. I wonder who, yeah. who's here with us tonight, our sewing friends, if you maybe still have the first machine that, that you got, you know, it, 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 those things have um, a lot of um, sentimental memories, yes. you know, it's hard to, <laughs> hard to part with them when you've spent so many hours together. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, your own sewing somewhere along the line took a turn into teaching others how to sew. So tell us a little bit about how that all got started. So that's actually, um, I credit that idea to Maria Swolik from Brother. She said, you need to start teaching. And I said, teach what? Because <laughs> she watched me and I do all these, you know, events and, or go to events and I'd be sewing. And she says, you need to start teaching. And I said, teach what? And she, she just kept repeating it. And so finally, I started teaching kids classes. And uh, so I always think about her when people ask that question, because it really is her credit. I never thought about teaching. And I remember as a young adult, my babysitter would say, you need to be teaching. But she would never, nobody ever said what. So when Maria said, I was kind of like flustered. I'm like, teach what? She goes, teach sewing. <laughs> wow. She taught um, locally there in not too, uh, in the Chicago area for, right. for many years. And I still keep in touch with her. So I will, I will tell her that. I don't know. I don't know if she knows how much oh, she, knows. she inspired you. She does. Okay. <laughs> she knows. That's great. So did you teach in a store then? Did you start I did teaching same, in a store? the same one she taught at actually? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I taught there well, maybe two and a half, three years. Adults and children? I taught adults and children. Okay. And I taught some, I did some generational teaching there <laughs> where I have the kids come in and then the parents will come. And then I had two, two cases where the grandparents came. Parents, meaning the male and the female. Wow. So wow. yeah, it was, it was fun. It was fun. And how have you found um, teaching adults and children to be different? I mean, what kind of, do you use different methods? Uh, obviously you're going to use different projects and that, but 
you know, have you found it from a, from a beginner perspective anyway, are beginner adults and beginner children alike, or do you see a difference in how you teach? Oh, it's, it's very different. The children have no fear of anything. You just put it in front of them, show them what to do, and they'll do it in most cases. Adults are like, they've already heard that knits are hard, or they've heard that zippers are hard, they've heard that buttonholes are hard, and they don't want to do that. And they heard that, you know, the machine is difficult. Well, kids don't have that, and they haven't heard that from anyone. So the kids just go forward and they'll just make whatever you teach. And the adults kind of pull back a little bit, a little bit of fear. You have to watch them gain their confidence, uh, which comes along actually a little bit slower than it does for kids. Well, but adults it, it, have had have had criticism in their life by the time yeah. they're an adult. And exactly. that, that's true. That that's what <laughs> um, that's what stops a lot of people from doing something is just the fear of not doing it perfect or right, right. And having somebody else's, maybe somebody else's standards too. So, wow. It must be fun to see, you know, how children react then with, it with is. That. It's, it's, it's nice. Cause you see what, what I see in kids is not the confidence boost in the sewing. You see that, but you also see an overall confidence boost where they know they can complete something. They can, you know, make a project. They can make something that they can wear. I have a little girl that I mentor uh, she's not a little girl anymore, but um, I started mentoring her when she was in second grade. And so I, and it was only an hour a week. And I thought, oh, maybe I can teach her to sew. So I got permission to bring the machine in and start teaching her. And I've lost track of how many things she's made. But the one thing that she made was a skirt. When, that was her first garment. And we made it at school in this hour. It took us almost three weeks or four weeks. Um, and I didn't know what happened with the skirt, but I ran into her mother over the summer. And her mother, mother said she wore it on Easter of this year. <laughs> so I was like, she wore it? That's good. She's wearing yeah. her stuff. <laughs> did, you, did you have um, with, with your students, you know, whether adults or children, did you, did you find that some of them came to you because they had something very specific they wanted to make and they had mm-hmm. a kind of a dream that they wanted to make come true? Yeah, kids come in with an idea of what they want to make, even though you're teaching them something else to, to get the basics in, but they know what they want to make. They'll tell you, I want to make this for my mother. I want to make this for my dad. And, and so we'll get to those projects for them, especially if it's for an adult, for a parent. I want to get that done for them, even for their siblings sometimes. So so we do, we've done that. Um, and so we veered off of my plan to get them to what they want to make after they got the basics. And adults come in and and they have unfinished projects that maybe their mom started and never finished and they want to finish it or something that they attempted to do themselves and they never finished it. So we can, we can get through that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about, you know, that being that, that specific. Um, How about um, some specific student success stories? Can you, you remember some, particular things that they were, you know, some of your students were really, you know, it just really, really turned out exactly what they wanted it to be. And you saw that kind of that light bulb moment. Yeah. So one is a skirt for sure. Um, and, and it was a circle skirt. So, you know, she's a girl, a little girl, and she's twirling around in this thing. So of course she loved that. <clears throat> but other kids have made uh, bags that they carry literally until they wore them out. They just carry them everywhere. They've made zipper bags. They've made a drawstring bag and double drawstring bags and tote bags. And they just use them until they completely wear them out. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, I think it's hard to find a, a good sewing teacher. And for a lot of people, um, I'm looking at um, some of the chat and when, when some of our, our friends here um, started to sew and some wishing they would have maybe taken even more courses. I mm-hmm. think, you know, <laughs> I look back and I think the same way about myself, you know, I probably would have had more opportunity to learn even more things if I would have been more diligent about it. You know, have you experienced that with some of your students where they, you know, you're trying to like, just to get that message, like now is the time, you know, take your opportunity and chance. Cause once life gets busy, it can get a little bit more difficult to find the time to do that. Yeah. So I actually picked up a, uh, a student, no intention to pick her up, but I picked up a student in Joanne Fabrics. So she was struggling with what, what fabric to buy and how to match this pattern. And I kind of got involved because I could hear her struggle and I got involved and I, I pulled out a piece of paper. It was kind of funny. And I did this with it. 
I didn't think about this, but I'll show you with the napkin that I got here. Because she was trying to describe to me what she wanted. So I said, oh, is this what you're looking for? And this is exactly what I did. <laughs> and she said, oh, I got it backwards. <laughs> and she said, yes. So it's a, you know, there's a neckline, there's a sleeve, there's a... <laughs> and she says, you can do that? You can teach me that? <laughs> so she became my student and she brought a lot of stuff to me that she had attempted that was in pretty bad shape. So we took things apart, we put them back together. And, and now I see her Instagram uh, page that she really just started maybe, maybe a year ago at best. And some of her stuff is there. Oh, so yeah, so she's a therapist. So she calls herself the sewing therapist, I think, or something like that. And she'll post things that she's making. And so it's kind of nice to see her, the progress that she made from where she started. That's, that's definitely very, very rewarding, very yeah. rewarding. Well, um, I, you know, like I said, I think it's difficult to find good teachers today. So, you know, uh, online, you know, there's certainly that, that option. And I know you're doing some online teaching, but tell us, tell us now that you're not teaching in that particular store, what all the different venues um, are that you're using to teach these days? So these days, so I started actually teaching in my church, <clears throat> or I was supposed to teach in my church. And they, I think there was a new law regarding 501c3s and I couldn't teach there and, and accept money for it. So um, I walked out of that meeting into the coffee shop at church and the guy says, oh, how's your class going? I said, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I gave him the story. He goes, oh, my conference room is open on Tuesday nights from this time to this time. So I started, started teaching. I taught in his conference room for almost six months and I taught several people from church and that was kind of nice to know. And then from there, I actually started teaching some of those moms' children to teach. And so then I would do spring classes and summer classes at my house in my dining room. Uh, but now it's, I, I'll do one-on-one. -on -one. I can either go to them or they can come here. Uh, so far, I haven't had anybody here this year, but I have gone to a couple of people and, and taught and teaching them. Uh, so that's kind of what I offer. And what I plan to do, I got a new camera today. So maybe with my new camera, <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, maybe with my new camera, I can, not a maybe, it will be, uh, I'll start some Zoom classes. So the first one I want to teach is a kind of different way to make a tote bag than what we all know. Okay. So, yeah. So That's I have neat. that in mind. And then uh, another one is a, a top pattern that I designed to teach that. So that's kind of what I have in mind right now. That's what's well, on my I, list. I know, you know, you are, are definitely well known for um, your, your mix and match ability, I'll call it. And um, <laughs> I failed to mention at the very beginning that you have also been a guest on the uh, national PBS television show, It's So Easy TV. And um, that, that had to be a, a really interesting experience, I'm sure, <laughs> right? You want to tell us a little bit what, what that was like and what you taught uh, when you did your TV shows? So one of the things I taught is actually, I have it here, is this skirt. I'll show you. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so this, this was capris that were way too big for me in the hip. I lost weight. And so I didn't want to toss them because I actually like the color and the, the feel of this particular denim. And so what I did was just cut them, cut them open and add an insert because I got that big gap there. Um, and then I did the same thing on the back and I didn't need as much of an insert, but I just added an insert. And I like using the scallop lace because I didn't need to hem it. Plus it gave it a little bit of character. Um, so that's one of the things I taught. The other item I don't have here um, my daughter took it. <laughs> it's a dress. It's a red dress, red knit. And I use three different patterns. So I use one pattern to create the bodice and I pull from another pattern to create the, the skirt portion of the dress. And then a third pattern to create a flounce on the sleeve. And yeah. And it's kind of funny because when I got it all done and I put it on the mannequin, I didn't like it. So, so I made a belt for it and then I loved it. <laughs> well, you have a real knack for that and you're right. It's all about um, all the extra pieces that kind of 
you know, yes. make it maybe, you know, a little lace added to the sleeve or, or, you know, a little trim on the neck or adding that belt. And, you know, that's some of, of, of what's so, so thrilling about making something yourself, because you always have that opportunity to add that little extra icing, yeah. icing on the cake for sure. <laughs> yeah, yesterday well, or a couple of days ago, I pulled out a two piece um, sweater set, twin set. <clears throat> that I made and it's much, much, much too big, but I love the fabric. And so I thought you still have this, you don't want to give it away. So who knows what that might become? It's going to become something. <laughs> it's a very open weave knit fabric and I just love it. So that's why I'm still hanging on to it. <clears throat> there's making and there's remaking. <laughs> yes. and, and it's fun to do both. We've got a few, um, a few people who have taught in here. Let me see if I can Good. find them here in the chat. Yeah, we've got um, Jane. Jane has taught classes and and still does. And um, Joey uh, also taught uh, children. So um, she says they did great. And uh, somebody here said they loved seeing that light bulb moment. So yeah, that's always yeah. Um, that's always really fun to see. You're passing. You're passing along. Uh, a legacy and something that really could potentially last a lifetime for sure. Yeah. And then Linda wants to know where um, Linda and uh, Angel want to know where they can look for your classes. So why don't you go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about um, where you're actually teaching online or how that's, you know, if you. So right now it will be the Zoom classes um, and those will be posted soon. They're not posted okay. yet. Yeah. So will you post that on your blog or on your website? It will be posted, will be posted on my website and in, and within my group. Great. And are you going to cover garments or what are you planning on teaching? You want to give us a little peek into the window there? It will be garments. I'll start with that tote bag because I think it's such a unique way to make it. Uh, so I'll start with the tote bag and then I'll go from there to garments. And uh, just kind of basic garments. And then we can, as we progress along, we can get into adding sleeves and adding other elements and changing the pattern to make it fit, those kind of things. Well, I know you're gonna give us some uh, some tips on on garment sewing uh, tonight and you've got some samples to show us, right? I do. You wanna, you wanna pull one of those out? So this one um, was actually a class that I taught and it's just a, it's a basic garment, but the pocket is built into that seam there. Uh -huh. You see that? So it's the fabric so looks so beautiful and drapey. What is that um, jacket made out of? This is a ponte, actually. Okay. Very lightweight ponte, like a double knit. Better than double knit, though. <laughs> it's a ponte. It's just a shawl collar, so it's no big deal there. I've got a lot of top stitching going on here. You can see. Well, top stitching always always tames those areas that would normally oh. want to flop and fly around, right? It does, because that would have been flopping around, especially on this particular fabric. So it serves and then top stitch. And I love using my serger for finishes. So, and I added my label to that one. Beautiful. Yeah. I love the drape there. So fabric-wise, Carrie, I, you, I know you're, you live in, in and around the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. And I've been there a few times um, shopping and there used to be a multitude of choices there. I don't know what, what there is now, but um, where are some of your favorite places to, to look for garment fabric in particular? Cause that's always the harder one to find. I have three favorite places. My all time favorite is Vogue Fabrics in Evanston. So a little bit of a drive, it's about 45 minutes for me. Well, they're moving to a Chicago address, but it's not much further than that. Actually, I think it might even be a little closer. Um, so that's why I could go in there and just stay forever for hours and hours. And I have stayed there for hours. <laughs> a lady told me one time I had been in there for three hours. I'm like, no. And she goes, yes, you came when I started. <laughs> so I left uh, with a ton of stuff. But um, And they have a, plethora, a plethora of things. They have their button display is just, it's this wall and more. <laughs> just the buttons. They have patterns and other things there. So that's one of them. Another store is in Chicago. It's called Rainbow Fabrics. And oh, I don't have that garment here. No, I don't. I had it on yesterday. It's, I don't know, somewhere around here. But they have really pretty, bright, vibrant 
fabrics. And they have a room in the back that's considered their, uh, I don't know if it's a clearance room or what it is, but they have beautiful fabric back there. And I, sometimes I can't believe the prices. It can be down to like three, $4 a yard, where a Friday it might be 13 to, to $30 a yard. <laughs> but yeah, and, and they sell, they do sell a lot of special occasion fabric, but I tend to use special occasions for me, for regular stuff. <laughs> You can't tell, but I like color. <laughs> so, uh-oh, I lost you again, Joanne. Nope. Uh, Vogue does mail order, don't they? Yes, they do, online the, order. The Rainbow Place, do they do, do they do mail order too? Rainbow doesn't do mail order, but if you call them and uh, they're, they're, they're really knowledgeable, if you can describe to them what you're looking for, they know exactly what you're talking about and they can, they'll hold it aside for you. I'd love to know in the chat what some, um, some of your favorite <laughs> shopping <laughs> places are, um, whether it's in your hometown area or online, because um, you never know if somebody might be close by you and, and on the, you know, online here with us tonight. So you can certainly share those resources. Um, it, yeah, it the is, nice thing about going to Rainbow Fabrics is about, two to three miles away is what we call the warehouse. Um, and I can't think of their actual name, but we call it the warehouse. And they have either four or five floors of fabric. And if you're looking for that fabric that you haven't seen in ages and you need it for something, it's in the basement. It's there. <laughs> that much, wow. Yeah, yeah it's there. Well, let's go back to that that beautiful jacket. I want to talk just a little bit more about that because um, I don't know, maybe everyone isn't familiar with uh, with the variety of different knits out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought maybe you could share some tips with like how do you how do you select a particular fabric for a particular pattern? How did you know that the Ponty knit was going to be the right fabric choice for that? Can you tell us? What's yeah, so, that? so usually when you have a cowl neck, you, you're going to need drape. You don't want it to be, you know, fussy stiff. You want it to drape and flow. And um, this one, nope, I have another sample, but I have another one that you can put a belt on to fasten in the front. But this one just hangs open. So you want it to be nice and soft. And sometimes you can just pick up your fabric and just give it a little shake and see what it does. And I'll hold fabric up against myself and just move around and see how it moves. And, but, you know, after a while, you kind of get used to, you know, that particular fabric is going to do that. Um, but I, I like, I like ITY knits as well because they're so flowy. And so I use those for tops and dresses and skirts. Uh, this one I would use for, this one you can also use for pants. So it doesn't have to be always a top. This would be a nice. Yeah, there really is a fine art for selecting not only the right the right type, but the right thickness of fabric. Right. You know, drape it. drape is is you know very important, like you said, with with certain styles. But the weight of the fabric contributes to the drape. Wouldn't you agree? It does. Uh, it does. And even on this one, you have to have a pretty deep hem. I think that's an inch and a half. Yep, yeah, it's about an inch and a half, which is a little bit deeper because the pocket, because of the drape of the pocket, you didn't want that pocket to completely overpower the hem. So you need to put some weight here to handle the pocket. So you're kind of balancing that. Yes. A little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Now tell us a little bit, you know, if, if we were uh, in your sewing room right now, I know myself and a lot of our friends here that are, that are with us <laughs> and Anita says, good fabric is worth the price for sure. And I will it is. second the motion yes, on that. Definitely. But if we were in your sewing room right now, I know what a lot of us would be, would be doing. We would be peeking at the inside there. We'd say, <laughs> show us your seams, Carrie. <laughs> I'll um, show you my seams. <laughs> so give us maybe some, some ideas of how you've finished the, the raw edges in there, or if you finish them at all, and what are your, your favorite ways to handle um, knits as far as finishing the seams. Okay, that one is completely, it's all serge. It's all finished with the serger. This one is a little different. So this is a Conte, but it's a texture um, as well. Uh, and it has really nice straight. And this one I added a flounce to the bottom of. Oh, that's so we so really needed that straight, right? And I also made a belt so you can tie it. It's a little, it's a little bigger in, in width. 
So you could nice. tie a belt around. It's a cow neck as well. But on the inside here, I finished it with the serger. And is the back of the wrong side of that fabric is actually it's a, black. a dark color? Okay. Yes. And the outside. Wow, that's interesting. So I did two things because of that. So I, I got the serger stitches going here. But here on the inside of the cowl, let me take it off the hanger and hold it up for you. So this is the front inside. I added a binding. I added a black binding because I didn't want to see the serger stitches, which look like that. Okay. What's the binding made out of? It's just cotton, just cotton package bias binding. Okay. Bias binding. Yeah. yeah. Good old, good old standby. Good old, right? yeah, good old standby. So there it is. Oh, that makes a beautiful finish. Yeah. So when it opens, you, you know, you have to think about what do you want it to look like when it's open? And I didn't want to see this, this look. I yeah. wanted to see a finished, really finished look. So I just added binding. And I, re I remember thinking about it. Did I want this stitch to be the gold or did I want it to be black? I did gold on black. Nice. And yeah. do you have, okay, so, so you used your serger at least to finish the seams on that one, right? Just to. This one, this one I made it with the serger. Okay, you actually made the whole, okay. So yeah, so I used four you, threads. Okay, did you um, alter the pattern to, because we all know that a serger only sews a narrow seam. So did you alter the pattern first? How do you, how do you, how do you, that's a, another whole great topic, but how do you fit yourself? Got any, any tips for that? So this one I didn't, when I'm, when I'm making something with the serger, I don't alter the seams. I, I do the cutting on the serger. So I'll cut, I'll stitch up to that five eighths inch seam and cut the rest of it off. And I'll end okay. up with a three eighths with a three eighths inch seam left. Yeah, our sergers um, actually all, if they don't, you can mark a line, but most of them have a line on them so that if you guide the raw edge along that line, yes. the point where the blade cuts and then the final needle in the serger seam sews the seam ends up being at that five eighths inch point. Yeah, most of them, the foot is five eighths inch wide. And so if you put it there, then you'll see that it's going to cut off the rest of that when it hits the blade. So, and that's, that's really just a practice. That's not, <laughs> that doesn't come naturally to anyone. I don't think, I think you have to practice that. The good thing for me is that I started using the surgery when I was in my twenties. One of my companies that I, the company that I worked for at the time was throwing out surgers. It was two of them and they threw them out. They were throwing them out and I asked if I could have one and they gave me one. So huh. the lady, the lady who had used it had kind of taught me how to use it. Um, and so I took it home and I just started making and searching all sorts of things. And was that a home model or was it an industrial? It was an industrial. It was an industrial. <laughs> an industrial. Wow. Well, I'm familiar with those too. And I know there's no threading codes on there. There's no, no, there, there's no there, manual. There's, there's no, no manual. shooting guide. There's no I only had, I only had Charlize. I had to call her all the time. I was like, okay, I try to do this and it's stuck. And she goes, oh, take this out, do that. And uh, yeah, I worked on that machine a, a lot. I mean, they even asked me one time at work to repair a flag and I did it on the surgery. <laughs> wow. But yeah, this is all surgery seam. And so the other thing with knits is you want to stabilize your shoulder all the time. So this is a the close clear, look at that. This is clear elastic here. Just stitched right in. And you can see I stitched it with the surgery. <laughs> And that really forms a, uh, it, it functions as a, a, a good stabilizer, right? Yes. So your shoulder doesn't lose its shape. Because once it loses its shape, you almost can't fix it. So it springs back. Yes. It springs back. Yeah. So you got a little stretch, just enough, but it's going to always pop back. Whereas if you, you know, if you stretch something else, then it's not going to pop back. So you it's use there. that... Mostly in the um, shoulder seams or? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I always stabilize my shoulder seams when I'm using knits, regardless of the weight of the knit. I've even just... seen uh, the clear elastic, which I'm a big fan of clear elastic. I love using it, but I've even seen it recommended for use in uh, knit uh, pants in the, you know, the whole U-shaped <laughs> seam so that it I doesn't. I haven't done uh, that. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't, you know. I have seen that though. Drag down. <laughs> Cause that's a, that's the thing with knits and, and um, you know, you've probably experienced this too. A lot of times they, they, as they hang, 
some of them grow a little bit. So do you recommend, you know, kind of like, um, some of them grow a lot. So before you hem, before you hem your garment, you want to hang it and you hang it minimum 24 hours, six, 12 hours. is not enough. And I've seen it where, uh, I think I posted a picture in my group and said, look at this. I did. It's not crooked. No, I didn't make it crooked is what I said. One side of it grew more than the other side. And it was, a, it was a circle skirt. So you definitely, if you're doing something like that, you definitely need to hang it because now you cut that on the bias and it needs time to grow. Yeah. And then yeah. you hem it. And in this case, I did it. I had to hang it twice because I have the seam at the waist. So I let the top grow before I added that flounce. Very good. Because you don't, you don't want to suddenly finish this garment and your waistline is, you know, two inches below your weight, your actual waist. So you want it to stay where it's supposed to be. So, and knits, even though they they're the whole fabric yardage is stretchy. When you did that flounce, it's a little bit similar to bias in that some areas bias. will stretch more than others. Exactly, and that's why you know, especially with bias cut woven fabric, you always want to you always want to let that uh, hang out too. Before. Yeah. Yep, and the knits because they will stretch. They'll just keep growing. <laughs> So how about hemming? What's your favorite way to, to hem knit garments? So on knit garments, I like, um, to, I don't have a cover stitch, so I, but I do like using twin needles. Mm-hmm. And I think I have one here. It's a great substitute. And, and it's something I do often myself because sometimes it's just quicker <laughs> to set up the machine for, for a twin needle. A cover hem does have more stretch. So if you're really working like, on a lot of knits or a lot of super stretchy knits, the cover hem stitch, um, because it's made up of more loops, will you know stretch a lot. But yeah, I can see that. It, do you yeah. have a preferred size that you like to use of the twin needle? Oh, so I like the, the 75, the 8075. My machine um, doesn't like the 100. It okay. doesn't fit. And so how you about have spacing? To, how about the distance between the two needles? Well, that's the 2.0. So I like the 2.0. Okay. The 75 needle is my favorite. Um, and I have tried the 100. So I tried to go big. <laughs> and my machine's like, I'm not doing that. I looked at it and I wasn't sure. So I hand cranked it. And sure enough, it wouldn't go in there. Yeah. So be, be careful when you go big. Just kind of test it first. Well, they do, they do come in a, in a wide variety of different sizes. They're sometimes a little bit hard to find, but if you can visit your local um, sewing machine dealership shop, <laughs> which is yeah, always my favorite know. place to go if you have one locally. Um, but even don't. with selecting my 2.0, I still test it and see if I really like it. Sometimes I don't, depending on what I'm making and what that fabric is like, that 2.0 is not always good. And then a lot of times you have to... Uh, stabilize that as well, that hem before you put that twin needle in there, because if you don't, you'll get the pucker right between the two needles where it kind of sticks up a little bit. So if you stabilize it with a strip of um, fusible knit binding, some are called fusing knits. They have a lot of different names, but if you stabilize with one of those, then it should go nice and smooth. But test, always test. Keep those scraps. Test. I keep my scraps until the garment is completely done. <laughs> Just so I have those pieces to test with and do whatever. Lost you again. I had to turn that off because my cat is um, meowing at the door here. She's probably going to join me in a minute here. <laughs> Yeah, she'll be here. You'll see her tail in a minute, probably. <laughs> oh, my. Hard to keep her away. <laughs> but um, the fusible trico is what I was talking about. That really does make, uh, yes. it's like made to marry with with um, knit, with yeah. knit, knit fabrics. Um, yeah. It's interesting, though, because even that particular interfacing has a very little stretch along yes. the lengthwise grain. Right. But a lot more stretch along the crosswise. So if you want it to stretch with your fabric, you want to use that crosswise layout. If you want right. it to stabilize the stretch, then you use the lengthwise, lengthwise. layout so that exactly. it kind of calms it down. So, yeah, um, there's so many different choices these days with uh, with interfacings. Do you have any other types of you know preferred interfacings that you like to use? I actually am guilty of using that on a lot of things. 
the, the Trico is my one of my favorite ones. And the one I'd buy is called French Pews. But I just, I'm just in love with it. And it works well in um, woven fabrics as well. If you need more body, then you go, go to something else. But if it's a lightweight garment, I love that for almost everything. It waistbands, all of it. It definitely works. I um, uh, had act, uh, worked in a outlet store of a garment factory um, many years ago and got to see what they used inside. And they used that very same Trico interfacing in silks and wovens and knits and just about everything. Because it, what it does is it, it doesn't change the character of the fabric, really. It kind of, you know, right. stabilizes it, but but kind of keeps that same character of the fabric. So that makes it. And work. another trick is, is if you don't have that um, clear elastic, you can use a strip of that uh, interfacing on your shoulders as well. So back to fitting yourself, because we started to talk about that. We didn't, we didn't get very <laughs> far. Um, it, it looks like to me, like some of those garments that you showed us already are, are a little bit what I would call a forgiving fit, meaning they're not the type of thing that, you know, you're going to have to make sure the cap of the sleeve lands right on your shoulder bone. And, you know, you've, you've got some, you know, you got extra room in the width. So if it's a, an inch bigger or an inch smaller, it's not really going to make that much difference. Is, do you like to pick patterns like that, that are a little more forgiving or, um, how do my, you know my body that? likes fit and flare. <laughs> so where it fits up through here and then it can, even this that I have on is the dress, it flares out at the waist. So I needed to like come away from my waist and then go down. <laughs> so I tend to do that, but I do like my shoulders to fall in the proper place. And I have done where I've measured um, and used my regular, because your shoulder's not going to grow, <laughs> but I've measured. And then for some reason it didn't fit. And I do, I just do an alteration and take it in just a little bit, whatever. And do you like to, do you ever um, make what we call a muslin, which is nothing more than a, a mock-up garment, meaning you're making that pattern up in some fabric that hopefully is similar. You're testing I, all the fit. Yeah, I do muslins on something that I haven't made before or something that has a different fit than what I'm used to. Um, but on, typically on my tops, I don't need to make a muslin anymore. If it's for someone else, I do. And I, it's kind of funny because I made a muslin for a lady who wanted a skirt, And I had this really crazy peach, awful looking fabric, but it was a woven and she was using a woven. And so I made it with that. And when I brought it down for her to try it out, she goes, what is that? <laughs> I go, oh, this is your mock-up garment. So it's not your garment. <laughs> but yeah, I do. I'll, I keep some uh, inexpensive knits around. And I keep that one, I don't know, forever living bolt of woven fabric. I've had it forever, but it works for what I need, what I need it for. Yeah. So and I do a little bit of draping. I don't do a lot of draping on myself because I kind of know how things should fit me, but I do draping on my customers sometimes, if, especially if they want something unique. I'll take the muslin fabric and kind of drape it across them until I get what they want. Almost say what I want, but what they want. <laughs> that's, that's an art. That's an art when you're sewing for people. Do you use a dress form? I do. I have a couple here. I have one that's larger and I have a really tiny one here in the corner. So I use them. I have the, the larger one is adjustable so I can adjust it up or down, but the other one. Yeah. So what about, um, you know, some tips for, as I said, I know you're really, and you did a, a whole TV show on it's so easy on combining patterns, but how do you, how do you, do you combine different brands or do you recommend you stick with the same brand, same size? How would you, you know, how would you help us um, see how that goes? I do both. I mix brands on that particular one. I think I stuck with, with the one uh, brand, but I have mixed brands. If it's something that I really want, the piece from this and the piece from that, I'll put them together. The only thing is when you put them together, when you, I lay up, I lay the pattern out, I'll cut the pattern out and then lay it out on the table to see how those pieces kind of intersect. And then I'll do some adjustments there. Uh, so then I'll have a second pattern where I've traced out on it, but I don't want my waistband from brand A that might be bigger than the waistband on brand B where that top and bottom doesn't fit. And actually that's what happened with that pattern. 
the one that I did on It's So Easy, I talked about that just a little bit, where you want to make sure that that all lines back up. And that's when you get out your curve rulers and your pencil and your paper and your pattern paper and trace it out and make sure it all fits together. Okay. So well, I, I'd, I'd be interested to know with um, our friends that are here, like who, who really likes to sew garments for themselves? Who likes to sew garments for others? <laughs> I'd love to see what, what some of your, um, some of your input is on that. And I'd like to know if there's anybody out there who's, um, who's, who would like to sew garments, but they're, they're kind of afraid to, because that's the next question I'm going to ask you, um, Carrie, if you, you know, some, you've taught so many different people and have you ever had where they picked a pattern and you said, no, nah, this just, you're not, this isn't quite ready for you yet. Or you know, I have, yeah, I have like the young lady that I talked about who, who posts on Instagram. Now we, we talked about, you're not quite ready for this. Let's get you, let's get these things fixed and then we can move you to a pattern. And the pattern she picked was was quite involved, but we got it done. Uh, and she was just determined that she wanted to make that. Okay, we can make that. We just can't make it right now. <laughs> so, so sometimes you have to push back. And you have to push back with customers too when you're making garments for them. Some things are just not, that flat picture that they saw wherever is not appropriate for their body type. So you have to gently say, let's do this instead. Let's try this instead. And, and in most cases, they listen and sometimes they they don't and they're not happy and then I'm making a ton of adjustments that I normally wouldn't have had to make and by the time I'm like halfway through that they go oh okay I see what you were talking about <laughs> well it's you're the voice of experience so yeah. you know it, it it takes them understanding that first of all for sure but then you get when they change their mind I made a v-neck top for a young girl, not young girl. She's probably about 10 or 11 years old, but she wanted to be next. She was going to her brother's wedding and then she wanted to overlay over the dress. So the dress is really simple, simple V-neck, short sleeves, no big deal. Did the overlay. And when her mom came back for her fitting, for her own fitting, she brought the girl's dress back. And I said, is that the dress? She said, yes, yeah, she wants a scoop neck. And I said, well, you can't make a V-neck into a scoop neck. You need more fabric now. So they did. I mean, they bought more fabric. It was four weddings, so they wanted what they wanted. But when the girls tried it on at my house, she seemed okay. But when she got home, she wasn't, she didn't want that neckline. So yeah, maybe she saw somebody else with a scoop and that was made what made her probably <laughs> <want the> scoop <laughs> instead. <laughs> They, I did it for three of them for the mom and both the daughters and they look beautiful in the end, but oh. that one dress was like, yeah, you can't convert that. <laughs> so for, for those who would want to sew garments and, and kind of want instant success, uh, what would you recommend like pattern wise? Do you have any particular brands you'd like to stick with or, or styles or, you know, give us a little idea what you might, what you might recommend for somebody so, that's in that range. So some of the indie patterns are, the instructions are difficult to follow. And then it's a lot of work. So it's a lot of work for a beginner. I wouldn't suggest that for a beginner. So by gotta, indie, by indie, we mean the not independent. the major, not, not the simplicity, McCall's, butter, right. blah, blah, blah. Right. Because yeah. I think my top pattern is, I think it's 14 pieces of paper altogether, somewhere in there. Uh, and that's, even that's a lot to have a beginner tape together, figure out their size cutting line and trace and, and do all that. So I wouldn't recommend that for a beginner because they just get frustrated and they'd be done. Yeah, because you're talking about printable PDF, which are have to be tiled. They call it tiling. Right. Where right. You have to print them all out and then tape them together in the right order. <laughs> so or you can send them out and have them printed, but when they come back, they're so gigantic. You know, it's still a struggle for a beginner to work with. Yeah. yeah. So I would go with what we call the big four. So Simplicity, McCall's, Butterick, and Vogue. Vogue has an easy Vogue. So don't be afraid of the Vogue patterns. Just make sure it's an easy Vogue to start with. And the other ones, you don't necessarily have to get an easy one, but there are easy patterns within all of those companies, all four of those companies. So I would get that. Something with basic lines. You don't want uh, a, bod a, a bodice that's here and then below and then at the waist and then something else and then something else going on. So I would go with maybe no more than three basic pieces, top, bottom sleeve, and leave it at that. Okay. So go with something like that, or even just uh, two pieces, 
top, I mean front, back, and sleeve. That's what this is actually. And I actually taught this, <laughs> this dress, but it's just front, back, and sleeve. Okay. And do you find yourself um, repeating patterns and just changing up? I, again, you, you've done a lot of the changing up, but do you I don't you know do if that? you can see here. I'll I can see it. your baskets. This basket is all my TNTs. <laughs> okay. Um, so all my, all my what, tried and true. Tried and true. Okay. That I use over and over and over again. And uh, I haven't added to anything to them in a very long time. This dress. I happened to see it in the store last year or year before last. And I didn't know it was still out there. I made this dress in 1990. Out of some crazy colors. But when I saw this, I'm like, that's that dress. Yeah. A <laughs> lot yeah, of so times you'll see they'll they'll repeat a pattern mm -hmm. and they'll just change the, the photograph on right. it. But um, I know, um, you know, those, those, those basics are definitely... The kind of thing that you can do over and over again, put a little different trim on it. If you have embroidery, yes. add some embroidery, yes. make a different length, you know, um, do a little um, placket or slit on the side, change the neckline and you have something totally different, right? Right. And I love, I love to make dusters. So I have three TNTs. This one is for wovens and I change up the sleeves all the time, change the length, change the sleeves. And these two are both for knits. And I've made changes on them as well. When you have something for knits and you switch to a woven, then you need to enlarge that pattern by at least one size and be very careful of the sleeves because the sleeves might fit close. This is a close, very close fitting sleeve on this one. And this one has a little bit more give on the sleeve. But yeah, so I use those and I intermix these three together. <laughs> well, dusters are, are definitely your signature style. I've seen you wear... Yeah. <laughs> Many beautiful dusters and you, you wear them really well. They really look beautiful and they're easy to sew, aren't they? They're easy and they're fast. Yeah. Very fast to sew because you've got your two fronts, your back and your sleeves. And, and then however you want to finish it, whether you want to add a band. I think this one is the one I just did for um, Sewing Machines Plus. And I added a band in the end to it. Okay. And then after the show, I didn't quite finish the sleeves. I had I had a sleeve on, but I hadn't hemmed it. And so after the show, I tried it on and I cut the sleeve off and I added a band. So I had a band on the front and a band on the sleeve. Uh -huh. Yeah. Do you but try? I tamper with them all the time. <laughs> yep. Do you try on your garments a lot while you're, while you're sewing with them? I do. Even if I've made it before. I'll try it on. Like, do I really want it that long? Do I really want it that short? Do I like this sleeve? Is Does it still fit well? Because, you know, we gain weight and we lose weight. Does it still fit well? I had a dress. I pulled a dress out of the closet. In pre prepping for this, I pulled this yellow dress out of the closet. And I go, when did I make this yellow, yellow? Like, when did I make this? And why haven't I worn this? So I'll be in that this weekend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're challenging yourself. But, but it is, it was a TNT. It's a uh, top. The top that I have on the, the photo that you use for this from It's So Easy, I lengthened it and made it a dress a couple of times, but I just like the lines on it. It's got really nice lines on it. And I love top stitching on that particular pattern. So when I saw that yellow dress and I thought, oh, I don't remember doing this, but I'm going to wear it now. I don't care if it is fall. <laughs> I'm reading some of the comments here. Society says she loves your dusters. And Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Josie says she's too short to wear a duster. Josie, I'm a, I'm a little on that mm, smaller stature too, but I think sometimes it's it's a matter of um, what you wear it with too. So, yes. you know, I, I like to recommend that for garments that you've never, never used, be, you know, never worn before, styles that you've never worn before, try to find something in ready to wear and try it on. And, and you might be surprised. Now you might, you know, feel the same way once you get out of that dressing room, but it's a great way to try things by going, you know, and trying on some ready to wear. Um, I've even been known to take my tape measure in there and measure the width of the hem or the length of the sleeve or that type of thing. So that when you go to, you know, custom make your own, you can kind of, you know, use that as a, as a guideline. And I'm and seeing play around, Patty, play around with the length because, yeah. you know, Petite women can't can't always wear that floor length dress or that floor length duster. You know, make it think about fingertip length. Your arms straight down to the, to the tip of your fingers. Think about that length. And maybe exactly 
your calf length or even above your knee, the length of a, a normal jacket. Yeah. And sometimes yes. when you're, when you do it in a monochromatic tone too, yes. you know, where you're, we're all the same color or the same color family, basically it's a, it, it's um, a little less out there, you know, for some of us that just have, you know, feel more comfortable and a little bit more. Um, yeah. This one, I don't like with, I don't like with pants or jeans. So this one has a dress that matches that yellow in there that I made to go with. And I like, I just like that particular, this particular style with the dress more than I do with pants or jeans. And it already scrolled up on me pretty fast, but, uh, oh, it's, it's a uh, society. Society would like um, to include some of those tried and true pattern numbers in the information following the show. So yeah, I'd be glad to do that. If Carrie, okay. if you'll forward some of your favorite pattern numbers that you think okay. are, you know, hopefully still current. Although, you know, these days you can find a lot on the, on the internet yeah. on, use patterns in that too, but or that would be great. Something similar. That would be great. Yeah. Cause I think that I, I think, you know, from, from what I've heard from a lot of people, and as I was trying to get a feel from um, everybody, all our friends that are with us here tonight, you know, if you've, if you've been like a little bit leery of garment sewing um, or you've been, or you've gotten a little rusty, maybe you did it, you know, years ago, um, you know, what, what you would, maybe find some really quick success with, because I think that's, that's important. You know, if you're, you're going to have is. something you want to, and, and speaking of success, we, we all want to see what the other side is. Can you think of some garments or some sewing experiences you've had that just like didn't work, not doing that again? Oh, <laughs> any, yes. <laughs> any thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so when I, so I stopped sewing for years because I was, fam because of family issues. And so when I came back to sewing in 2008, I thought I could sew overnight like I had before, <laughs> make something overnight. <laughs> so I made this, um, of all the fabrics to choose, I made a fleece back suede. I thought it was gonna be like a circle type jacket. It was my own pattern. I cut it out, uh, self-drafted. And I got all the way to close to the end and I put, the sleeve on upside down or something. I did something with the sleeve and it was getting late. So I was done. Um, and then a few weeks later uh, or months later, I don't remember. Uh, so news magazine says, send us a copy of your flukes. So I sent them this picture and said, this is what I did. I didn't have a picture. I just said, this is what I did. And I kind of explained what I did wrong. And they, um, they actually posted it in their magazine and I won a little prize for it. <laughs> But that was awful. And people asked me, do you still have it? I said, no, I just got rid of it. <laughs> I was done. <laughs> but yeah, I've done other things where I'll, I'll try a different style and it just doesn't work on me. One of the things that doesn't work on me, and I know my body type, is to have that seam across the waist where your bodice is separated from your dress. That doesn't work for me unless I have a belt on. And I don't really wear belts. So, so I know that doesn't work. And I've made, uh, I made a coat once just wasn't for me I gave it away <laughs> we lost you again on the other side what in your um sewing history has been some of your all-time favorites uh for yourself so yeah so I think uh I've made several coats for myself and I still have them and I still wear them. So one is, one I just posted a couple of days ago, it's a reversible fleece coat. So fleece on both sides. So that was fun to make and um, it's just warm. It's so warm because it's two layers of fleece and, and it has pockets on both sides. <laughs> so happy with that. And then there's another pattern that has a giant band of um, grow grains ribbon around the bottom and the the shape of the hem is asymmetrical so you have like this you know ribbon going one way and then ribbon going the other way and I love that coat so that one I'm making another one I'm going to make it again this year and they I have a tweed wool with a red lining actually <laughs> Ooh, that's, that's one of the things I like to do I love surprise linings in purses and bags in my garments 
And that's another thing you'd never find in ready to wear. They're going to use nope. boring, standard, ordinary, and you can really, really make something shine with that. Exactly. It's neat. Well, um, you know, we've talked about a lot of different, a lot of different sewing um, ideas. I'm in the sewing room. I'm looking at your space there. You know, it looks pretty organized there. You get your favorite patterns in that basket. And I always <laughs> like to ask um, what, what, maybe share one or two of your own favorite tips for, for being, you know, more productive or happier in your sewing space with how you have things organized and laid out. One of the things for being productive, and I'm on the other side, of the, I'm facing the other side of the room, but I always like to have my machines in the L shape or a U shape. Right now they're in an L shape. So the surgery is right here or the machine is right here and the surgery is off to my side. And so that just allows me to just kind of swing back and forth. I don't, I've seen rooms where they have, you know, machine, 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 surgery, 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 and one chair on wheels. I'm like, how, how do you do that? I don't understand that. <laughs> I mean, the rooms are beautiful, but I don't, for me, it wouldn't be productive enough. And I mean, when I say turn, I literally turn. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to roll anywhere. It's right there at my elbow. So that's one of the things. The other thing is I love, um, I don't like messes a lot. (laughs) So here's my bobbins. (laughs) Oh, that's nifty. Yeah, it is. And they're in there. This is all of my, this row is embroidery bobbins, just a few of them. But this is all my regular thread that I use on a daily basis. And I don't, so I don't have to worry about, like some people like to pair up their bobbins with the actual thread. The way I store my thread, I can't do that. So my thread is in a really deep drawer uh, and it's in color order. But th- this is a lifesaver. They're called bobbin savers and they are lifesavers because it's not coming out. You won't yeah. lose it. So if the I cat the, comes up I and knocks it over- cheap. I have the donut shaped one. I have that too. Yeah. And, and you know what I like? What the other thing I like about them, speaking of the donut shape, I have three of them of the donut shape. You can write on these with your marker. Oh, so if I you wanted to that. keep it separate by machine, which I do. So I have one that has just the, uh, my embroidery machine and it's marked for that machine. I have two embroidery machines. So it's marked for the other one as well. And then um, my sewing machine is one brand. And that's on there. And then my backup machine or my, what I call my training machine is a different brand. So that's on there because those bobbins don't fit. When you start mixing your bobbins, you'll start having trouble and you won't know why. Don't mix your bobbins, guys. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Good tip. Good tip. And so labeling would be another one of your tips there. (laughs) Label, label what you have. So you know what it is when you go to reach for it. That yeah. And, and yeah. And speaking of labeling, so I buy these little boxes. I haven't had to buy any in a while, but I, I got these from Office Max and that's my, all my market type sharps in there. They're in the packages. They're in there. Very and, good. Then, and then these are all my specialty needles. So, and they're in there. So I know if I'm looking for a twin needle or an embroidery needle or whatever, then I know it's in this box. And then I even keep one to separate my quilt pants, the large from the small. So I have more of these, I only wrote these out. Very good. So if we have any last minute questions, get them in, get them in now so that we can um, we can ask Carrie before we, we wrap up here because we're getting close to the end. And we Karen, are. you know, we've talked sewing, 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 but <laughs> we all have another life besides that, <laughs> a little bit anyway. What have um, you know been some of your uh, favorite getaways? Like, do you have any particular hobbies when you're not sewing? What what might we find you doing? I'm an avid reader, so I read a lot. But I also do our, um, and I read everything except sci-fi and horror. So everything else I read. Um, but I also uh, help with our food pantry on Thursday. So that's a big thing to me. I've been doing that. I think this is my ninth year now. And our, we've been outside, serving outside for a year and a half. Uh, so that's on Thursdays. And then once a month, we meet, um, I may meet with a group of ladies who make dresses for, um, little dresses for Africa. And so we just ship, we're shipping out today. Yes, today, 100 dresses today, 109 actually. So we're excited. And this is our fourth shipment of about that amount. So we're excited about that. I'm going to talk about one more thing. Uh, because I know people struggle with this and this isn't pretty, but um, I'll pretty it up at some point with my scan and cut. But this is how I sort my bob, my pressure feet. 
So each compartment, you can't see it because if I hold it up, they'll start falling out. But each compartment is labeled by that foot. Because I, you know, how many times do we see, what foot is this? What's this foot for? <laughs> but if you find some kind of way to make a, find a compartment, and I think I bought this on Amazon for a couple bucks, but just label it and put your presser feet in there. That keeps my presser feet organized. And sometimes I do forget what the foot is for, but I don't have to because I, it's labeled. <laughs> That's great. That's great. It's really nice to have, um, you know, uh, everything just, just the way it should be when you're, when you're looking for those feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So, yeah, I know a few times I've been on mute here. So you saw That's me okay. talking and didn't hear me. It's this new microphone. It picks up a lot of sound and I was trying to keep the, the crying cat from, <laughs> from disturbing everybody tonight. But, um, Carrie, this has been really, really, really wonderful. Um, you know, there's uh, several people in here that have asked about your question, uh, asked about your classes, some questions about those. And um, uh, one of our ladies here wanted to know if you're going to be Zoom, Zoom classing the uh, two-sided fleece coat. I could. Okay. Well, maybe we'll... we'll um, I could. I could like add I said, to we're, my list. We're going to have all of Carrie's contact information in there. So uh, you can get a hold of her and you can give her your requests and then yeah. um, keep in touch and, and, and see what happens. Yeah, I'd love to see that list of suggestions. Yeah, for sure. So, and Carrie, I definitely want to have you on again. We did talk a little bit um, before we went on live about uh, the fact that you use the scan and cut um, to do things too. So we'll definitely do another, another show um, with that. Okay. And I'd like to encourage everybody, if it's your uh, first time here, thank you for coming. If you've um, been here before. Thank you for coming back. And if you're new to my Let's Go Sew with Joanne Banco channel, I'm going to ask you to subscribe. And if you like the channel, please subscribe and please be sure to hit the bell for notifications. And then you'll know every time we do a live show. This monthly live show happens on the fourth Monday of every month. I always have a great guest like Carrie um, to share their sewing knowledge and sewing information with all of you. So Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you all next time. Happy sewing. Thanks, Carrie.